Hi, everyone. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the uh, next uh, nano explorations uh, talk uh, given by Avinash Kumar, a graduate student in my group who started uh, working on our group back in uh, uh, 2017, uh, back at NC State before moving to MIT with me um, in uh, 2019. And his work has really um, focused on um, uh, uh, functional oxides um, and exploring those materials at the atomic scale to relate structure and property. And that's what we're going to hear more about today uh, in his talk, uh, decoding complexities in relaxer ferroelectrics um, using electron microscopy and specific the aberration corrected microscope down in uh, MIT Nano. Um, and if you'd like to learn more, um, certainly contact me or Anna Osharov um, about this instrument. Um, I'd also like to mention today that this talk is being recorded um, and we would encourage all participants to remain muted throughout the duration of the talk. Um, afterwards, we're going to have a Q&A session. Um, so hold all of your questions until then. Um, or um, as we go along, you can certainly add them to the chat um, and we'll, we'll, we will um, address those at the end. Um, and you're, you have two ways of participating. Uh, one is either ask the questions in the chat, as I mentioned, or raise your hand at the end and uh, we can um, go through one, on, one by one um, each of the questions. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Abhinash who will uh, give us a great talk about electron microscopy. Uh, uh, thanks, Jim, for the introduction. Um, and I hope uh, everyone has a, a good day today. <laughs> Um, so today I will be talking about um, decoding some uh, complexities in relaxed ferroelectrics using aberration corrected uh, electron microscopy. Um, so to start with, um, first, as we what we do, as uh, we mainly focuses on scanning transmission electron microscopy, uh, we try to image uh, at atomic scale and try to find the main structured property correlations. Um, in the different materials. So I'll be showing different examples of uh, what, what we can do using the electron microscope we have at MIT Nano, which installed um, um, in early this year, and what we can do from these microscopes. And then I will move to what we can learn about relaxed ferroelectrics using these uh, electron microscopy data. Uh, so to start with, uh, STEM, uh, I'll just give a brief introduction about what we can do here. Um, so as we know that um, electrons we, uh, we have, uh, we can, electrons can be generated, um, which can go pass through the specimen and then scatter. And we can collect uh, using different detector, um, different scattering um, signals. And using these signals, we can get information about atomic number um, as, as you can see, analog dark field detector can give Z contrast where here the example of strontium titanate, where strontium is the heavier atom which shows more brighter contrast than the titanium atom. But ADF also lacks the contrast from oxygen, as you can see, uh, which can be imaged using the other techniques. Um, and one other techniques which we can use to image oxygen is one of them is uh, differential phase contrast imaging. Uh, differential phase contrast imaging can be done using a fourth segment detector or a direct electron detector. A uh, fourth segment detector where you uh, just divide this segment, uh, just uh, a detector into four segments, A, B, C, D, and then get a signal of A minus C and B minus D, which forms the vector component, which can later on integrate um, to generate the projected potential or which will be proportional to the uh, phases of the specimen. And these are sensitive to light elements. One can see uh, even hydrogen in these materials. Um, you, here is one of the example of varium titanate where we can see at nanoscale what are the different domain structures in barium titanate? As these detectors are also very much sensitive to the changes in the polarity in the materials or the electric field inside the materials. 
And here is example of what we can do at atomic scale using these DPC images and combining with the ADF imaging. As I said, ADF images can give Z contrast, uh, but we can, it lacks the contrast from the oxygen atom, the lighter elements, but we can use the IDPC, which is integrated differential phase contrast imaging to get the oxygen position. So we can use these detectors simultaneously to get the information about all the atomic number elements, the lighter and the heavier one. Then using these signals, we can also generate the electric field map. As I said, those four segment detector um, can be sensitive to the electric field inside the materials, which can later on be integrated to form the charge density maps and which can be useful to understand the ferroelectric materials mainly. Here is a few examples of what uh, currently I'm working on um, is the example of silicon carbide. We are trying to focus on what are the different dopants which we can um, introduce in silicon carbide to get qubit or other kind of properties. So here is um, the image of silicon carbide grown on silicon. This is 3C cubic silicon carbide. As you can see that these grows uh, with a lot of defects because of there is a lot, uh, big lattice mismatch between silicon and silicon carbide. Um, and we also found that these also, while growing uh, on silicon surfaces, silicon likes to reconstruct first at the interface as these dumbbells, silicon dumbbells, um, try to tilt at the interface of silicon and silicon carbide. We also try to understand different uh, multiferroic system. This work is done uh, in collaboration with Professor Carolyn Ross group. And here, what we are trying to understand is YFO, uh, which is a central symmetric structure, have the inverse in symmetry, um, but in the thin film form, these source ferroelectricity. And the question was why it um, started showing the ferroelectricity at thin films. And we investigated that and we found um, that anti-side defect of yttrium in iron column leads to ferroelectricity in yttrium rich sample and which was not present in the iron rich sample. And uh, these convergent beam electron diffraction, which is here position averaged, uh, we, we can find the polarity in the material. And we found that experimental, which is the yttrium rich sample has, is showing the, is breaking of the inverse in symmetry. And this work has also involved the DFT calculations, which found that the, with insertions of anti-side defects, the structure likes to go up from orthorhombic centrosymmetric to rhombohedral structure. And it, uh, the experimental data of PACVID um, is showing the similar trend of breaking the inverse in symmetry. We also found that our presence of antiphase boundaries in these yttrium rich samples. And these doesn't mainly uh, involves in breaking the inverse in symmetry directly as we found that uh, different um, uh, yttrium rich samples doesn't have these antiphase boundaries. These only shows at very high yttrium to iron ratio. Uh, but these are uh, very important uh, for other conductivity uh, measurements to understand how the properties of this YFO film uh, is. So here, um, as I said, ADF and IDPC imaging can be performed simultaneously and it, here, IDPC images show a better contrast of antiphase boundary than the ADF images. That's why these IDPC technique is extremely uh, critical, become critical and uh, mean very useful tool to understand defects in these thin films. As you can see that uh, here, it can also show some contrast oxygen, but as these oxygens are very close, it is very hard to resolve. Um, and we are working, still working with how we can enhance the, um, the resolution of these, from these uh, materials. 
We also found that these antiphase boundaries are interesting in terms of there are iron antiside defects present at these antiphase boundaries rather than yttrium antiside defects. And this, these antiside defect formation uh, in the DFT calculation shows that these have positive formation energy, which is not possible, but it is, uh, it is forming in these materials only at these antiphase boundaries, so it requires more investigation using the DFT calculations and other uh, measurements. Um, now, with a brief introduction about what we can do with electron microscopy, uh, now I want to come back to the relaxed ferroelectric, which is this topic. Um, so relaxed ferroelectric can be distinguished from classical ferroelectric based on their phase transition. As traditional ferroelectrics have a soft phase transition as Curie temperature, while the relaxed ferroelectric has diffuse phase transition. One of the popular relaxed ferroelectric system is PMN system, and which can be alloyed with uh, lead titanate to get PMN PT with different composition. And one can see that the traditional ferroelectric have a broader P loop, uh, while the relaxed ferroelectrics have slimmer P loop, which has a, a lot of advantage in terms of the energy storage devices. Um, as I said, this PMN materials can be alloyed with lead titanate, which forms a morphotropic phase boundary at about 30% PT. And this is very important because at 30% PT, it shows the highest electromechanical coupling coefficient. So this, this is showing very high piezoelectricity at one composition, which is morphotropic phase boundary, but there's a lot of uncertainties why exactly uh, it shows at morphotropic phase boundary such properties. To understand that, well, first we need to understand what is the origin of relaxed ferroelectricity. Uh, one of the major um, role which, which polar nano region play is, the, is originating the relaxer ferroelectricity in these materials. It is found that these PNRs can coexist with normal ferroelectric domain structure and these basically forms the low angle domain walls. And these PNRs also allows to rotate the polarization easily, which accounts for higher piezoelectrics in these materials. There have been several modeling, uh, uh, modeling work, which has been done to understand how these PNRs rotate and generate these piezoelectric coefficient, but there is, um, there is different theories have been proposed, which is still a debatable topic uh, and could not uh, come to a conclusion what is the exact origin of relaxed ferroelectricity. Um, so there are a few models which I just want to touch base on. Uh, one is the very popular is polar nano regions in a non-polar matrix, which has been proposed about 40, 50 years ago, and uh, which is still people use it. Uh, but recently, there are different theories uh, have been also proposed based on seeing the structure using the diffraction data uh, and other measurements. Um, as other theories are presents of chemically ordered regions, which doesn't correlate with polar nano regions. But there's uh, another theory which says that there is a correlation between chemically ordered regions and polar nano regions. And recently, it has been proposed that there, it is not existence of polar nano regions in non-polar metric, but as a polar slush model, which is existence of multi-domain state. This opens up a lot of questions, is what is the nature of chemical distribution and ordering in these lead containing relaxer as there is magnesium, niobium, and titanium, how these distribute on the B side, and what is the interplay of the local structure and the local chemistry in these relaxers, and why, how these PNRs originate in these materials is, is extremely important to answer, uh, to understand the structured property correlations in these relaxers. And then later, can we tune the property of relaxer using different dopants or the strain 
or um, or different uh, um, other kinds of processing techniques. And this has been a frustrating system as in this area, people have said that relaxed ferroelectrics are fascinating and useful material, but they seem to be a heterogeneous and hopeless mess. Uh, and recently, uh, there's a very good quote which has been used for relaxed ferroelectric is, the study of relaxed is reminiscent of the old legend about seven blind men and little fan with different features appearing to be predominant importance of depending on method used. And this is in this a this has been proposed in this area because X-rays says different story about origin of, of ferroelectricity, while the neutron scattering data analysis shows different. Um, so that's why we want to know what exactly happens in this material to get a combined uh, unified story about origin of ferroelectricity. Um, so to start with, we have performed the aberration character uh, image, uh, aberration character electron microscopy imaging on these uh, PMN system. And here is analog dark field and IDPC images. As, as I said in the beginning, ADF images shows the Z contrast. So here you can see there is a change in the, in the image uh, contrast at the B site, which is the magnesium and niobium site, uh, while there is no contrast from oxygen atoms in ADF, while the IDPC shows nice oxygen contrast in, in these images. So we can get information about all the cations from ADF and all the anions um, and cations both in IDPC. So we started with um, understanding how we can quantify the information what we are getting from ADF and IDPC images. First, to start with, uh, we have started analyzing the ADF images, which shows that there is an alternate change in the contrast at the B site. As here, the, the red signal shows the higher image intensity than, and the blue signal signifies the lower um, image intensity than the mean value. So these forms, as you can see that these forms are checkerboard pattern which has the alternate red and blue. And we try to use the correlation method to find which are the regions which has these kind of correlations. And we found that these regions can be easily uh, mapped and can be easily termed as chemically ordered regions. We did this with different composition to understand what is the effect of different um, alloy composition of uh, PT, content in these PMN system. And we found that as we move from PMN to PMN 30 PT, the amount of COR decreases from 40 to 10% in PMN 30 PT. Um, and mainly these COR, just to uh, term in the terminological way, uh, we can say that these CORs forms like a beta one and beta two site, where beta one site is basically magnesium rich, and beta-2 site is niobium rich. These compositions uh, occurs in two is to one ratio, such that there is local charge neutrality happens in the material. And we performed this analysis on approximately 6,000 unit cell, such that we will have a better strategy to understand this material system. Then we found that there is, has been report recent, recently about the role, key role oxygen play in determining the relaxed behavior. Um, as I said, X-ray and neutron scattering has been mainly used in this uh, relaxed system to understand the origin. Uh, there has been discrepancies about what we see in X-ray and neutron scattering. As X-ray scattering shows mostly the cation displacement, it shows very symmetrical pattern while the neutron scattering shows asymmetrical pattern and neutron scattering captures both cation and oxygen, it is termed that this asymmetric diffuse scattering could be coming from the oxygen displacement. So what we require is the direct measurement of local structural changes in oxygen displacement, which will help us to understand the origin of relaxed behavior. So using the IDPC images, we 
try to quantify how much is the octahedral distortion or octahedral tilt uh, changes during, across these material systems. So here first, we started with octahedral distortion as one will have the higher value um, and uh, in the neighbor will have the lower oxygen-oxygen distances. What we found that, again, it forms a checkerboard pattern and which changes across these different uh, systems as we go from PMN to PMN 30 PD. And using the similar correlation method, we found PMN has about 20% of the projected area, which has the octahedral distortion region, which decreases to 12% in uh, PMN 30 PD. So all CORs are also decreasing, and then octahedral distortion are also decreasing. Uh, then the question comes, is there any relationship between these octahedral distortions and the chemistry changes which happens locally in these materials? Uh, to understand that, uh, we plotted oxygen student distances with respect to the normalized intensity of the B sites. And we found that there is, there is a moderate correlation which exist between the oxygen oxygen distances and the change in the local chemistry in these structures. And here we also found that the niobium rich site lead to the oxygen oxygen contraction, while the magnesium rich site, which, which will show the oxygen stretch. As you can see, that the lower value has the higher, uh, lower normalized intensity values have the higher oxygen oxygen distances. This agrees with the theory predicted from the density function theory, as we found that the magnesium leads to the stretching of the bond, while the niobium leads, leads to the contraction of the oxygen oxygen bond. And also, uh, we found that 65% of these octahedral distortion regions exist in the same location as the uh, chemically ordered regions. Uh, next, we found using the IDPC images uh, that octahedral not only distort, but it also likes to tilt. And these octahedral tilt also forms this checkerboard pattern in PMN system, um, which decreases as we go from PMN 30 PD. We also found that this pattern also changes from um, this checkerboard in PMN to more stripe-like domains stripe-like oxygen-oxygen um, tilt or distortion in these uh, PMN 30 PD. Using the similar correlation method, we found that 20% of the area in PMN uh, covers the octahedral tilt region, which decreases to 10% in PMN 30 PD. Uh, then next, how whatever we are understanding using these chemically ordered regions, uh, octahedral distortion regions and octahedral tilt regions, can we correlate them with the projected polarization in these materials? So here what we have done in terms of taking these IDPs images and we converted them into how much the cations is moving from with respect to the anions, which forms the projected polarization. This is a uh, approximation where the net displacement is proportional to the projected polarization. And what we found that here the nanoscale domain exists, as you can see that there are regions, um, nanoscale regions which have the correlated uh, polarization. As we go from PMN to PMN 30 PD, we found long range polarization starts to uh, appear and which, which says that as we increase the PT content, the, it goes away from the relaxed behavior and go more towards the ferroelectric, normal ferroelectric behavior. Then we try to, can we correlate these changes uh, in the chemistry and what we are finding using the oxygen octahedra, uh, can we correlate that with the polarization? Here, what we, we have done, is we found the nearest neighbor distances between the domain walls, which we found using this projected polarization map. And then we 
but the center of the chemically ordered region, octahedral distortion region, and octahedral tilt regions, and then find is these are correlated somehow or these are just random distributed. And we have performed uh, these random displacement, uh, random distribution um, uh, trials, which and then found that these are these can't be repeated, um, especially correlated using the random trial, and these experimental data, the distances between the domain walls and these inhomogeneities is, is, can be distinguished from this random distribution of the domain walls and the uh, inhomogeneities. So there exists a spatial correlation between the inhomogeneities locations and the domain walls. And how we can simply understand this phenomena is by understanding just a simple example of boulders in a river. Uh, here in these relaxed ferroelectric materials, chemically ordered regions, octahedral distortion regions, and octahedral tilt regions form such kind of boulders, which likes to change the polarization in these materials. And this also matches with the recent theory of, um, from the MD calculation, where the multi-domain state exists. And the origin of that we found using the electron microscopy is the uh, formation of inhomogeneities. I'd like to just summarize here, and then we will move to uh, some more experimental results on PMN system. Um, so what we found in PMN is a chemical order gradient um, where this beta one and beta two sites forms the chemical order regions and ordering decreases to a minimum at antiphase boundary, which is, which agrees with the simulations. A structural order we found in oxygen sublattice, local distortion on oxygen sublattice is correlated with um, B site uh, chemistry as magnesium likes to move away, uh, oxygen likes to move away from magnesium and move towards the niobium. And we also found that octahedral, ordered octahedral regions um, are anti-correlated with the um, chemically ordered regions. Projected polarization measured from cations and anion atomic columns, which have been found that especially correlated with the presence of inhomogeneities in this system. So in final, relaxer behavior arising from a combination of energy barrier originating from chemically ordered regions, octahedral distortion regions, and octahedral tilt region, that impedes the long range polarization in this PMN and PMN PT system. Uh, I'll just touch base on some other system which also uh, matches with our theory of presence of inhomogeneities which leads to breaking off this long range polarization. Here is one of the example of BCT, BZT thin films. Uh, this is a lead free system. And here what we found that zirconium and titanium forms the chemically ordered regions, which is along 110 plane. Um, and these likes to impede the uh, polar, uh, long range polarization in these materials, along with the octahedral distortion regions in uh, the distortion regions in, these, in this system. So this theory of presence of energy barriers as inhomogeneities, uh, which is correlated with the domain walls, is, can be used in different material system as well, and can be generalized. Uh, I'll just touch a little bit on what we can, how we can uh, modify the PMN system and try to uh, tune the property using different, uh, different components like strain, or can we you see how the finite size effects um, affects the uh, relaxed behavior in these thin film forms. So here is one of the example of 0.5% strain in uh, PM and PT system and 0.75% strain and how these changes the domain walls and uh, changes the relaxed behavior. So here is 0.5% strain. And here what we found that um, there are elliptical domain structures 
which forms in 0.5% compressive strain samples. Um, and these are, have the larger correlation lengths, which is 12, uh, around 12 nanometer. But as we increase the, um, increase the strain to 0.75%, we found it to the Z direction, the domain size increases and it tried to go more towards ferroelectricity from the relaxer behavior. Um, about the finite size effect, we found that around five nanometer relaxer behavior is breaking and we are still investigating this is why exactly relaxer behavior breaks. Uh, currently we have data about 55 nanometer uh, with 0.5% strain uh, that it has elliptical domain structure, a larger correlation length, uh, which decreases as we go down to 10 nanometer, and there is a random polarization exist at the, at the interface. Uh, we are still looking into more uh, lower thicknesses and try to understand uh, how the relaxed behaviors are found in this. Yeah, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, a lot of people are here. Uh, this work has been possible only because of uh, a lot of people. Um, and uh, mainly um, uh, when we were at NC State, Professor Elizabeth Dickey, um, Professor Douglas Irwin, Jonathan Preston, they helped me a lot uh, in understanding that um, this relaxed system. And currently we are working with um, uh, Professor Lane Martin at UC Berkeley to understand how the uh, relaxer a thin film system works uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Andrew Rappe and Hiro and Yugo uh, in, in um, understanding using the electron microscopy and also using the MD simulations. Uh, also, there, it has been supported by funding agencies like NSF, uh, which uh, indirectly supports CDP. Uh, and thanks to NVIDIA, uh, who helps us in uh, combining how we can do uh, image simulations in um, using um, NVIDIA GPUs. And uh, I'd like to also thank MRL, uh, who has uh, provided instruments like Arn Milling, which uh, lead us to form good sample to image in electron microscope. And finally, uh, thanks to MIT Nano, uh, where um, Anna, Nick, and other MIT uh, Nano administration who um, helped in setting up the uh, Themis instrument and uh, leading us to uh, having a good results about um, about these relaxer system and other other kinds of system. Thank you. Great, thank you, Abhinash. Um, uh, let's open up uh, to questions. So Abhinash, um, I was curious if you could go through a little bit of, uh, you might want to, um, some questions about how you simulate um, the data sets, uh, how you can simulate the images that you, you get out from the experiments. Oh yeah, I could definitely. Um, so um, we can use a multi-slice simulation approach uh, where we can uh, use the different slices, we slice one supercell into different thicknesses, and then uh, we we try to uh, then we try to pass the electron wave kind of features, and then try to see how the uh, electron scattering uh, phenomena we can simulate using the uh, the final wave front we get from this image simulation. So this is basically the multi-slice simulation. So we can. Uh, also use the, the convergence angle we get from at the microscope and use the same, um, the same accelerating voltage. And those are the important parameters uh, and also including the collection angle. And then we can directly combine one-to-one -one with the simulation and the experiment. Great, I see uh, Professor Toller has a question. Yes, I do. Uh... Really nice presentation and uh, very impressive what you can do these days. So you are demonstrating the ability to uh, see ordering on a very uh, small scale. And I'm just wondering, uh, how does that depend on the thermal history, number one? And number two, how would that change if you 
increase the temperature in situ and how would that impact the overall activity of those uh, relaxer materials? Yeah, um, so thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, that's, that's a good question about um, the chemically ordered regions. Definitely the chemically ordered regions uh, will change with processing condition. Um, so this is just uh, in the bulk. Um, uh, it, it, this, so the work which I showed um, is uh, these samples have been grown in bulk uh, with a certain processing condition. So it definitely the structure of the chemically ordered regions will change. And what we found uh, recently in the thin film forms, the chemically ordered regions are not uh, very diffuse. Um, as I can, I can just go back a little bit. So what I, I mean here. So as you can see, the chemically ordered region doesn't have just like a SARP one, one place uh, ordered regions. It has like a diffuse background as well. Um, so this kind of, so this was like a, a certain equilibrium which has been reached near to these uh, chemically ordered regions. But what we found in, uh, in thin film forms, which is grown using the PLD method, these ordered regions are more kind of confined, not very diffused. So it can definitely change with different conditions and, uh, and conditions of the growth and different temperature will have different density of chemically ordered regions um, that, that I think uh, will definitely matters. So now you um, can in principle yeah. correlate how those uh, micro domains change with, with the processing and performance, right? I mean, yeah. that uh, it was kind of a guessing game. That's yeah, okay. right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so uh, as, as these we can change, then we, we can mainly changing the relaxer behavior. And then we are changing the P loop, um, which, which is basically a main determining factor for other, other kind of properties. So the second part of my question was, uh, to what extent can you repeat this at different temperatures? Uh, repeat this uh, same experiment in the microscope or um, yeah, yeah. Um, this we can do at different uh, temperature like lower and higher currently we don't have that capabilities we are uh, still going to acquire that uh, soon uh, but we can do at liquid from liquid nitrogen to 1200 C uh, temperature we can do in situ experiment in the microscope and exactly see how the how the chemically ordered region changes even uh, is there is uh, different um, uh, chemically ordered regions just combine, recombine, um, a coalesce. So all those phenomena, we can definitely see it. And then we can basically change the relaxing behavior. Great, that's exciting. Thank you, Abhinash. Thank you. And certainly there, you can also think about doing, um, uh, going through these different phase transitions um, and observing uh, the, um, electric behavior just disappear um, above the burns temperature and above the Curie temperature. So you can go through these uh, transitions um, quasi-dynamically. I mean, it's, it's quite slow and the sample drifts a lot, but um, there, there's a lot to be done in this area still in terms of the atomic, at the atomic level, um, observing these samples and, and studying these materials. All right, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, uh, Professor Ross? Hey, Abhinash, uh, lovely work. Um, so the YFO, do you think there's any chance of relaxer behavior there? Or is it um, li limited to these materials with more complex compositions? Uh, currently, um, this, is a, this is a great question. Um, and this has been in this area like about, is, is it important to have chemical, uh, this, um, these multiple component in the system? Um, the current report says that, like current uh, literature says that it's only possible in these, um, these multiple component system. Uh, but I'm, I'm still curious about like, if we have a similar as in WIFO, if we just dope it locally, how much that exactly changes things. Um, and I, I think that that's what we are still investigating a little bit more on onto that, like uh, can we um, generate more like um, some processing condition 
such that we can you know anti we can cluster these anti site at one location and then can we generate the relaxer kind of behavior in this viral world but i i think based on what i'm understanding from these um, um, different component system that i it, it could be a possible which uh, which maybe uh, later on we can uh, definitely uh, investigate thank you thank you yeah uh, i mean i can imagine doping it with something additional or you know, I, th I think the analogy that he used with this um, river um, being disrupted by boulders is, is, is sort of a, a powerful one in the sense that, um, you know, finding the right size boulders in the river to disrupt the flow of polarization. I mean, it, it's sort of um, a bit of an analogy there, but um, that could be tuned with um, processing conditions. I think it's quite, yeah. I think it's interesting from that that perspective. The one thing I did want to mention is that this is our final uh, nano exploration of the year, really at the very nano scale here. We've ended uh, ended it on a very uh, small note um, for the semester, but we'll be starting up again um, in February. February 2nd will be the first talk of the new year. We hope to see all of you there. And again, thank you, Abhinash, and thank you all for your attention and your questions. And we look forward to uh, seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.